Hello. Uh, we'll get started in a few minutes, but I just wanted to know if people can hear me. Uh, if you can hear me, just let me know in the chat box or the question and answer box, either one. Hey, can folks hear me? Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Like I said, we'll get started in about, looks like about seven or eight minutes, but thank you. Okay.
Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Statistics Solutions webinar on Chapter 1, the introduction. Uh, we have a co-host on who's been posting um, links. <clears throat> uh, so links to uh, our website, um, webinar archive, where this um, webinar will be archived, as well as others. Um, consultation link in case you're interested in that after you um, after the webinar uh, <clears throat> and also uh, information about receiving the webinar yourself okay um, so if you have any kind of technical uh, questions um, Brittany our co-host um, can help you out with that um, any kind of content related questions you know about what we cover um, fine um, you can type those into the question and answer box as we move forward uh, so you don't forget, but just to let you know, I won't get to them until the end. <clears throat> okay, so let's let's get started. Um, this is chapter one of the dissertation, which is um, the introduction. And you know, our model is based on the typical social sciences five chapter model. There are other models, um, but I think in in any of them, the the chapter one will will be the introduction. All right, here's what we're gonna be covering today. Um, the introduction to the introduction itself, uh, background, research problem, purpose, theoretical framework, definitions, significance. I have other sections in here because some schools um, require these sections, some schools don't, and a summary. Um, and let me just kind of pause here for a minute to say that um, first and foremost, you should get your school's template, <clears throat> the chapter or dissertation template. Um, what we are gonna present today is a good general template, um, which has you know, typical features and typical components uh, of a chapter one, um, but it's always best to um, go by your school's template if they have one. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's because, you know, sometimes things may be a little different. Um, sometimes the headers may be a little different or they'll be in a different order. But like I said, generally what, what we have is a pretty good, you know, a general, uh, good general guide or template. Um, the other thing is to, to kind of look at the, the chapter one, uh, you know, what its purpose is, you know, more largely than just focusing on the, the, the sections. Um, it's really kind of the, think of it as the blueprint for your study, right? It's going to answer questions for your reader and your professors, like what your what, the, the what, the why, and the how, right? So what, what are you doing? What are you studying? What's your topic? Why? Why are you studying it? Why is it important? What's the research problem? Uh, the how, how are you going to do it? Right? What's the method you're going to use? Um, what kind of information are you looking for? How are you gonna get that? So the what, why, and how, <clears throat> kind of the blueprint um, for the study. Um, typically progresses from there to the chapter two, which is the lit review, uh, chapter three, which is um, methods, chapter four, which is results, and chapter five, which is a discussion of the results. So just to help us kind of put the chapter one in a kind of larger context and to understand its purpose. Okay, so the introduction to the introduction, um, obviously you're gonna need to, to, for the reader, introduce your topic. Um, briefly introduce, describe the topic of your study. Usually this involves some kind of organizational problem um, that you're gonna focus on. It can be things like, um, if you're in education, declining test scores in a certain area. Um, maybe in healthcare, it can be, you know, the loss or the attrition of nurses or a specific kind of nurse. Um, so there's usually some kind of organization or some, some, some kind of social problem um, that you'll be looking at. Um, it's usually best to uh, kind of get the reader's attention right off the bat. Um, statistics are good for this, um, or even just a, you know, well, um, 
kind of targeted um, quote, or not, not a quote necessarily, but you know, a citation um, from the literature that shows that, that whatever you're talking about is a problem. You want to use um, a recent source here. Don't use a source from 10 years ago or a source from 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, statistics change, right? Numbers change. What may have been a problem 15 years ago may not be a problem now. So this needs to be a, 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 a recent relevant um, problem supported by recent statistics or a recent source. Um, okay, so whatever organizational or um, social problem you're talking about, then the next component, and this is really where your study comes in, is um, the research problem, right? So which is, which is a little different. This is the research that has been done on the problem, right? Um, what, how have people, you know, look at the issue? You know, what have they focused on? Um, what still needs to be done? What kind of study, what kind of information do we need to help us understand and address this problem? And that's kind of what your study um, is about. So introduce the research problem, but you have the organizational problem, the social problem. Okay, well, my, you know, my study is designed to address this problem by, um, you know, whatever it is you're going to be doing, um, because the research in the area is, it can either be insufficient or it can only be looking at things from a certain angle. Um, so introduce your research problem, and we'll get to the research problem in a few minutes. You know, so what is the issue in the, the research or what is the gap? Why is the study needed? Now, the introduction to lay all this out, obviously, you can't start here, right? Because to, so I would kind of, for your introduction, put a placeholder. Once you get the other stuff worked out, you can kind of come back to the introduction because um, I, I've, I taught writing for years and um, at, the, at the college level, um, you know, writing papers and essays. And we always want to start with the introduction first. But I always tell students that you don't, you, you can't introduce something until you know what it is you're doing, if that makes sense. So, um, so you can't just kind of start off with the, the, the introduction part. I would put a placeholder there, kind of come back to it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so after, let's see. Okay, we still have more of the introduction. Okay. Uh, state what is needed specifically to address the research problem. That's what your study is designed to do. Um, so at the end of this section, and it's not too long, um, maybe a few, a couple um, solid paragraphs. Um, it should be pretty concise. Um, but at the end of the section, your reader should know what you're gonna study, your topic, and why, what, what the reason is, what the research problem is. Now, all this stuff you're gonna flesh out later, right in the chapter, so this is just the introduction. Uh, you can also end um, with a preview of the sections of the chapter that are to follow if you want. So again, um, introduction, maybe a couple pages, uh, maybe a few paragraphs, um, maybe a couple well-focused well paragraphs, which leads into the background. This is where you can, you can add information and you can add kind of uh, more details of things. Um, <clears throat> so the background is kind of a description of, um, you know, where the problem has come from and, and not only the problem itself, like the uh, organizational social problem, some historical material on that, um, you know, like maybe nurse attrition has been going on for 20 years and it's still happening. Um, but more importantly, kind of the research, it's a background to also on the research on the problem, right? What have people done in the past? What are the trends in the previous research? Um, this helps set the stage then for your research problem, which we're going to get to in a minute. Um, so, yeah, what is the research on the problem today? You don't have to cover everything, but you should cover important studies. You should cover important trends. Um, and, you know, you should funnel down and kind of end with where the research on the topic stands today, which kind of gets to your your research problem, whatever the gap is or whatever the issue is in the research. And here we are at the research. And the background, uh, to talk about the length of the background. The background can be a little longer because you're, you may, you're gonna have to cover some material here. Um, 
and keep your reader in mind. You know, your reader needs to understand, um, you know, where the problem has been, where it is now, and where the research on the issue has been and where the research is now. Um, so they need to understand, this might take a few pages. And then you get to the, you kind of can transition straight in um, to the research problem. Um, and this is a kind of a more targeted uh, overview of the research on your topic um, that highlights uh, the research problem. Um, so you should specifically state the research problem in here. You know, don't kind of talk around it and hedge and everything. Um, state what the research problem is specifically and specifically state that your, your study is designed to address the research problem. Now, what is a research problem? <laughs> I know it sounds uh, like maybe you think you know or you have an idea. Or you, let's just kind of get it out here what a research problem is. Um, it's kind of just like it sounds. It, it's a problem or it's an issue in the research. And that issue or problem can take different forms. Okay, so <clears throat> um, a research problem could be a gap in the liter literature. It could be. Um, that's one kind of research problem, but, but it, it's not the only kind. Um, a research problem can be that um, we only have one predominantly one type of research or one type of um, you know study design you know, like say we have a lot of qualitative information on this topic but we don't have any quantitative or vice versa we have a lot of quantitative uh, studies on this but we need more exploratory qualitative research um, <clears throat> it could be that we've only approached you know a certain issue with, with a certain uh, theory, but we haven't used other theories. Um, so it, there is some kind of issue in the uh, in the research, some kind of problem, something that needs to be addressed. And again, the gap is um, people like to default to, hey, there's a gap in the research, because it, I think it's kind of an easy research problem to identify. But if you if you go with that one, you better be accurate, you know, because <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, you know, if you say there's a gap in, um, we don't know much about transformational leadership. Well, that's really untrue because there's mountains of research on transformational leadership. Now, it could be that we don't have a lot of um, research on transformational leadership in a very specific sector or a specific area or with a specific group. That may be true. So um, if you go the gap route, just make sure um, that that's defensible and that you've kind of look through the research, cover the research, and, and see that there is a gap, or you define the gap kind of precisely enough, you know, that um, <clears throat> even if it is dealing with something like transformational leadership, <clears throat> it may be that there's a gap in the research on a very specific um, group or a very specific sector or something. Um, this gets to how do we, you know, how do we, what does the research problem section look like? How do we frame it? Um, and this um, a little aside here, um, use your resources, you know, like these uh, webinars, um, use your professors, you know, whatever resources your school has. But it's, it's always good, I think, to obtain uh, a sample dissertation, approved dissertation in your area, maybe from your school. Um, these are available through ProQuest, ProQuest, um, which is available through your school library publishes all dissertations that are approved. Um, or you can ask your chair. Sometimes your chair is happy to give you a sample. Um, but it's always good to see how other people have handled these sections, like concretely, right? Like, because you can get a lot of advice and a lot of suggestions. But then when you sit down to write, you're still scratching your head. Um, so just, it's good to sometimes have examples uh, at hand when you're drafting these sections. The research section is going to be very targeted, right? It's not going to be very long. So if you're running on, you know, page after page for the research problem, you're, you're probably off. Um, because if it's, if it's well focused, it, um, because going on page after page means you're not focused. Uh, if it's well focused, I mean, it could be a couple paragraphs. I mean, maybe a, you know, maybe a couple pages at the most. Um, so it's a really tight kind of um, targeted overview of recent research on your topic that highlights um, what hasn't been done and what highlights the need for your your study. Now, if your research problem is a gap, 
um, <clears throat> there's a little catch here. You know, how, you, how do you describe a gap, right? Because by definition, a gap is something that doesn't exist. It's the absence of something. So how do you describe a gap other, other than saying, well, there's a gap. Well, then your professor says, well, how do you know? I mean, what, you, you need to describe the gap. So um, think of it this way. Here's a, a metaphor that, that I use. It may be helpful for you. Um, think of a donut. Okay, you have the, the center, the donut hole where there's nothing, right? Um, so think if your research problem is a gap, think of a donut. You're, you're not going to be able to describe the gap, the, the actual hole in the donut. So what do you do? Well, you describe the donut, right? And what is the donut? The donut is the research around what you're doing. You know, it's, it's the research that um, other people have done. They focused on this, but they haven't focused on this. They focused on these other areas. And here are some other trends, but they haven't quite done what I'm doing. So you get it. So by focusing on what other people have done, it highlights um, what they haven't done and it helps highlight what you're doing. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Um, next section is usually the purpose. Um, and they usually, again, check your school's template. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Let's see. Hard to hear static. Okay, I'm sorry. Is that any better for the static? I'm sorry. I just heard that. I mean, I just saw that. Any better? Okay, great, great. Okay. Um, did you guys get the research problem section enough? Do you want me to kind of cover it again real quick? Okay, great. Um, okay, the purpose. Um, so the purpose, again, check your school's template, but usually the, the purpose has a very um, specific wording. Um, and it starts like what I have here on the paper. And I know you can read it off the screen, but I'll, I'll just kind of highlight uh, some parts here. So it's usually phrased very specifically, the purpose of this, and you usually put your approach, your design study. So for example, just a, a quantitative example, the purpose of this quantitative approach, correlational design study, is to examine, um, and we'll get into the verbs, usually for quantitative studies, um, something like examine or investigate is appropriate uh, for qualitative studies, which tend to be more exploratory. Um, the word explore is more appropriate for qualitative studies. So the purpose of this correlational, uh, quantitative correlational study is to examine at whatever variables or concepts you're looking at, um, the relationship between uh, transformational leadership and emotional intelligence in, and that would be your sample and your setting and, um, you know, nurse leaders in whatever setting um, it is. So that, that's kind of the very specific wording and that's it. Um, that's, that's the purpose statement. Okay. Um, and then there, there might usually be some, um, the purpose usually section isn't very long, maybe a, a solid paragraph. There might be some more information about um, if it's quantitative, you know, the uh, the instruments you're using, that kind of thing. Um, if it's qualitative, it's it's very similar as far as the structure of the word. It, the, the words are a little different, but um, as far as the structure of the sentence, the purpose of this, let's say, generic qualitative study is to explore. Of course, you don't have uh, variables, but you'll have concepts, the challenges of African American women as they advance to positions as university presidents in, again, sample setting. Okay, so very, very specific um, structure for the purpose statement. <clears throat> and again, um, the uh, look at samples, but um, the, uh, the rest of it may contain a specific information, a little talking a little bit more about clarifying your concepts and your, or your instruments. Now the purpose statement, once you have the purpose statement down and your chair is good with your purpose statement, your purpose statement never changes. Okay, so this is the only, you get 
you get a pass with your purpose statement and your research questions throughout your dissertation. Other material in your dissertation, you do not want to repeat verbatim because they'll call you out. It's like you just said that somewhere else. But the purpose statement, if you have to um, repeat it somewhere, like in another chapter, it should remain the same. It never changes. The same thing with your RQs. If you have to restate your RQs, um, your research questions in another place in your dissertations, they never change. Okay, so just, just remember that. Um, but again, those are the only two things you get a pass on as far as um, you know, using the same language. And again, not a real long section, probably a solid paragraph. And with the caveat, though, of always check your school's template, because if they want something else in there, you know, you, you, you would need to provide that. Um, research questions. This is not um, a methods seminar. It, it covers chapter one, and most of chapter one is non-methods. Um, so if you're looking for um, development of research questions, um, we do run seminars, I'm, I'm sorry, webinars on research questions and methodology. So um, I would suggest that you go to one of those if you want like more kind of direct help on how to structure research questions. Um, but usually those are covered here. Um, okay, next section typically is the theoretical or conceptual framework. Um, and this is um, what the theoretical or conceptual framework is. Um, theories or concepts that are going to help guide your study. Um, they're going to help um, kind of guide your direction. And they're also going to help kind of explain your results uh, when you get to chapter five and you have to start talking about what your results mean. Um, the first question is theoretical or conceptual framework. Um, This is kind of, you know, it. what I always tell people to do is kind of a, a approach it practically. And what I typically see is um, theoretical frameworks are typically associated with quantitative studies. Conceptual frameworks are con, uh, typically associated with qualitative studies. Um, because for a quantitative study, for example, you're using instruments, right? Survey instruments, survey tools. Um, and these instruments and these tools, they have theoretical foundations, right? So they don't come up with these tools from nowhere. Um, they're based on theories. So <clears throat> what you need to do if you're, if you're doing a quantitative study, and we'll get to qualitative in a minute, um, you need to track down if you're using a, um, an instrument that's, you know, help, going to help you get the, the information you need um, to address your research problem. Um, dig back and see what the theoretical foundations are for your instrument. Okay, and that will be your theoretical framework. So if you're doing, let's just say, emotional intelligence, you're studying emotional intelligence and something else. Um, and you're using, say, Goldman's um, instrument. Now, there's several instruments to measure emotional intelligence, but you're using Goldman's for whatever reason. You want to then use Goldman's theory of emotional intelligence as your theoretical framework. Um, so in other words, you don't want to use Smith's theory of emotional intelligence because Smith has his own theory and there may be overlaps and Smith will have his own instrument. Um, so don't cross them, right? So if you're using somebody's instrument, you use that person's theory for your theoretical framework. Okay, now if you're studying, say, emotional intelligence and transformational leadership, same thing for transformational leadership. Uh, who, who's ever uh, uh, instrument you're using, you know, go back to their, to their theory, right? And then if you're studying those two things, those two, the theories for those two, um, for those two items based on whoever's uh, instrument you're using would constitute your theor theoretical framework. Um, for qualitative, um, it's usually a little different. Um, qualitative research is usually more exploratory to some degree. Um, so sometimes you, um, you don't have a kind of an all encompassing theory. You would need to base that on kind of um, 
concepts that you're dealing with that are based in the literature and kind of put those together to constitute your framework. So here's how you handle the section. You know, you define the theory or the concept, um, including any components that it might have that you're including in your, in your study or in your, um, that your survey covers. You need to talk a little bit about who developed it, you know, use sources for this, obviously. Um, again, you know, if you're using Goleman's um, theory, you know, you talk about Goleman uh, developing the theory. Um, and what did they develop it for? You know, theories, the purpose of theories are, are to explain things. Um, so who developed the theory? What have they developed it for to explain? Um, also, a little bit about um, what researchers have used it for, how have researchers taken the theory and, and used it. Um, and it's, it's important to talk about how does the, you know, how the theory connects to your study, right? How does it connect to what you're doing? And they're all going to be a little different, right? Because, you know, studies are all different. They're, they're all unique. Okay, so that's generally, that's how to approach the theoretical framework. Um, they're a little tricky. Um, they sometimes take a little trial and error. You're, you know, you're going to get some uh, comments from your chair. Um, work with them on you're kind of refining it um, until the comments go away. It's a process. Um, and also look at look at examples, like I said, um, from previous approved dissertations. Okay. Usually next comes nature of the study. <clears throat> and again, this is a method section, so I'm not going to go too too deep into it, um, but just um, suggest that if you have uh, you want more information about nature of the study or study design section, um, attend a method seminar. So, but this is basically a rationale for the selection of your design. You know, so if you've used you're using a correlational design, it's it's a quantitative study. Um, you know, why are you doing that? Um, you know, it's because you want to see the connection if two variables or two factors are connected, right? Um, you would summarize the methodology, including um, who you're going to collect the data from, how it's going to be collected, how it will be analyzed. Um, but again, you know, check a check a, a method seminar if you want um, more more information on that. Okay, next usually is a section called definitions. Um, <clears throat> A few points here. Uh, this is where you're going to define, you know, definitely define your variables, right? Your factors that you're studying, if it's quantitative, if it's qualitative, any major concepts that you're using, you know, whatever, you know, attrition, you know, if you're studying attrition of, of, of nurses, you know, that would be one of your factors, attrition. Um, define whatever type of nurses you're talking about, you know, any major concepts, any, any variables. Um, Again, check your template. I like to put definitions in the form of sentences. Um, it just kind of, some people put them in fragments. Some schools let fragments go, uh, you, you know, they work. Um, but a lot of times your chair will come along and say, you know, put it in the form of sentences. I just like them in the form of sentences from the beginning. That way you don't have to deal with it later. Um, definition should be clear and succinct. Now remember, these are definitions of, of, of your terms and your, your variables and your concepts that, that you're using in your study. So they're not discussions, right? Some people, you know, they go on for paragraphs and say, no. Um, the beauty here and the good thing for you is that these are like one sentence, two sentence definitions. And they are not discussions of like so-and-so defines you know, attrition this way and somebody else defines it this way and somebody else, uh, no, just, you know, for the purposes of this study, attrition will be defined as, okay, very clear, very succinct, um, or, you know, emotional intelligence refers to, or emotional intelligence will be defined as. <clears throat> so very concise, very clear um, structure to the sentences. Um, again, as they are being defined in your study, as you're using them in your study. Um, so that means no dictionary definitions. These are not general definitions. Um, these come from the literature, right? So they should be supported with peer reviewed sources. Um, I say at the end here, sources should be recent when possible. It's not so 
important here. I mean, that's good if you can do it. Sometimes, um, you know, if you're talking about a theory or something, your sources will be a little older. So um, the recency of them is not as important, but they do need to be supported um, from something from the literature and they should be peer reviewed sources. Okay. Um, and usually um, alphabetize your entries, right? So they just don't seem random. Uh, significance, this is the section that your professors like to call the so what section. So you're doing a study on this. Okay, who cares? So what? Um, so part of the reason, you know, we, we, we do research is not just to address a research problem. Of course it is, but it's to get information that can be used, um, you know, in, in further research and information that can be used at the practical level. So usually the significance has two prongs. It usually has a, um, you know, how's this going to be significant to research or the body of literature and how's it going to be significant or important to practice. So you can kind of structure it that way if you, if you want. Um, and again, the, always the caveat goes back to follow your template, but this is pretty good general um, uh, suggestions. Okay, what are the research and practical impl implications of your study? Why and to whom it is important? How might your findings inform practice? So let's just, for example, if you're doing an education study, who's going to benefit from the information at the practical level? It could be teachers, right? It could be administrators. Um, you know, it might tell teachers, um, give them effective ways to teach something specific. It might tell them that they need, you know, might tell us that they need more professional development, right? Um, it might, you know, your, your, your data may inform administrators um, about who they hire or, or whatever. It just depends on what your study is. But you get the idea and you can kind of get nuts and bolts here, right? Um, just, you know, at the real practical level, what does that mean that, you know, this information could be used uh, and distributed through seminars or through professional development? Um, if it's, you know, it's, it's a nursing study, it's going to benefit, you know, nurses, probably administrators, maybe nurse leaders. Um, so you got to think about who, who's going to benefit from the information, um, from your study at the practical level. Also, um, you want to talk a little bit about how this is, how your information is going to add to the body of research, right? So how is it going to, um, add to our understanding of the topic? Or how's it going to, um, it might tell us that, um, you know, we need to start approaching this topic from a different um, angle. Um, so just you need to think of um, how it might add to the body of literature, how it might contribute to the body of research. And again, this, this section is a real good one to look at how other people have handled it. But that's the general idea. Um, and sometimes they'll throw theory in here. How is it going to add to the theory? You know, how, are, how is it going to add to our understanding of the theory, which kind of kind of aligns a little bit with the um, how it adds to the research. Other sections here I've kind of lumped together because um, some schools, uh, you know, have have these. Some schools don't. Some schools have some and not the other, or they're mixed together. So you just have to check your template. Um, but usually they want you to talk about potential limitations of your study. Obviously, you don't know what those limitations are going to be until you, you start um, conducting your study, but they want you to kind of look for it and forecast um, uh, any potential weaknesses or shortcomings that may affect your results. Um, obviously, we're still dealing with, with COVID to some degree. Um, that can throw a wrench potentially into people's studies. Um, you know, may, you may have to change how you do interviews. If it's qualitative, you may have to do them through Zoom or over the phone. Um, you know, you may have um, trouble. People may not want to participate for whatever reason. Um, you know, so COVID it, it can create complications. Um, you may not get be able to get the population you want. So any kind of any any kind of challenges like that, you you foresee. And sometimes they want you to discuss how you might um, how you might address those. Like, so you can't interview people face to face. Okay, I'm going to interview them through Zoom. Um, so sometimes they want to talk about you to talk a little bit about how you how you would address these these limitations should they pop up. 
Okay, assumptions. Um, and, and these sections are usually not that long. Um, assumptions, you know, maybe paragraph for each, solid paragraph for each. Assumptions, these are things that um, you have to take for granted. You have to assume um, because you have no control over them. And a big, a major assumption for all studies is that um, you don't have control over um, over your participants. You don't have control over what they say. So you just have to assume, for example, that they are going to give you accurate, honest information. Um, there's another section. Again, these are these are relatively small um, scope. Sometimes it's called um, delimitations. Um, but these are kind of, this is kind of like the boundaries of your study, right? I mean, I always tell people, you know, if you've seen the old movies or cartoons or something and you see, they show somebody looking through an eye, you know, some kind of binoculars or a scope or some kind of telescope, you know, you see the round part where um, the visual area is and you have the black sides. Okay, that's kind of like your study, the scope of your study, right? It's like what it includes and what it doesn't include. Um, and it's going to sound very similar to your purpose. Um, and sometimes this is important if you're doing, like, let's just say an education study and you're just focusing on teachers or you're just focusing on a specific group of teachers, right? And not like all teachers, you know, you want to kind of define specifically who you're focusing on and, and who you're not, what you're including and what you're excluding. Um, and usually they, you know, you should talk about the potential generalizability of your results. And that means, um, Will your results um, generalize well to the larger study population? Um, and typically, if you if you have a quantitative study and you meet your um, you do a power analysis and you have a, a the uh, adequate number of participants, like your sample, you have an adequate sample. Um, your findings should generalize pretty well. Uh, if your sample is going to be low, um, that affects your generalizability. Also, your sampling method will affect your generalizability with random sampling um, leading to good generalizability because random sampling, it, you know, it kind of approximates, um, it, you know, a, a better kind of representation of the sample rather than if you did it through convenient sampling or something like that. Um, for qualitative studies, um, your results will not generalize well, and that is just characteristic of, of qualitative studies. Um, now they can give you, you know, they can give us insights based on your participants, insights into the topic uh, or the issue. Um, but because your sample is low, you know, you're going to be doing interviews usually, or it's going to involve interviews somehow. Um, you know, you may have interviewed 10 people, 12 people. That's a really low sample size. But the sample, it needs to be low for qualitative studies because you're looking for in-depth information, right? But you don't have that statistical certainty that you have with quantitative studies. So it's worth mentioning um, that qualitative studies, you know, the, the results are not going to generalize well, although they can provide important insights. But that's just kind of, a again, a trade-off of the, the qualitative uh, approach. Okay, summary. Um, this is the end. <clears throat> like any summary, recap major points of the chapter. Um, and don't do the fake study, which, you know, some people do the, I, I don't know what happens when they get to the summary, they, they, they just kind of want to phone it in or something. Um, I did this, 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 and this. And they just kind of list the sections. Um, just, you know, make it a real summary, you know, which it recaps, you know, major you know, some of the, the major points of the study, what you're doing. Here's some of the trends in the research. Here's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, and that gets into the next point. Remind the reader uh, of the research problem and why your study is needed. That's important. Kind of drives that home at this, at this uh, level of the summary. Um, and you can end, uh, if you want, by transitioning to the next chapter. The next chapter will be chapter two, the literature review, something like that. Um, and that's it. And here is our information. I'm going to leave this part up. Um, this is what we do. Um, this is our contact information. 
um, you know, if you want to set up a meeting to see if what we offer is is right for you. And we do, we're more than editing, we, um, we're a consulting um, service, we, we consult with you, we guide you, um, we offer statistics help. Okay, so I'm gonna open it up to questions. Um, you can type your questions in the chat box, you can type your questions in the question and answer box. Um, I'll give folks a few minutes to type in questions. If you have questions, I'll try to answer them. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for the kind words. Any questions? Okay, if there's no questions, I'm going to let everybody go. Uh, wish you uh, a great rest of your day. Um, and again, if you you know if you just want to see what we offer, you know there's no obligation. You can just kind of you know see if what we offer is a good match for what you need. Okay, let's see. We do have a question here. Wondering if you could speak to page length of intro chapter and number of sources recommended. Um, that's a good question. Um, Typically what I see for page length for chapter one is anything between like 10 to 15 pages. You know, 12 pages probably be in the sweet spot, but 10 to 15 pages I, I would say is a good uh, good estimation. That's, that's mostly what I see. Number of sources, that's a little tougher. Um, you know, it just depends what whatever's needed. I don't think there's, you know, Usually, sometimes for chapter two, your school will say you need, you know, 40 sources or 50 or something. I've never seen that in chapter one. Um, just you, you just need to make sure that like your definitions have sources, um, that your like your background and your research problem, um, you know, they're supported um, with sources. Um, any kind of material in your, in your introduction that's trying to grab people's attention with statistics or, or kind of recent um you know, insights that are supported uh, with citations. So, so there's really not a number there. It's just, um, you know, things need to be supported, like assertions, claims need to be asserted, I mean, uh, supported. Um, so in other words, you're not making kind of claims on your own or, or it appears to your professor, like, you know, if you, you make a claim and there's no support for it, they're gonna say, is that your opinion? Where did that come from? You know, who said that? Um, so no, there's not a recommendation for numbers of sources usually just, just, just make sure you have your, your, your kind of claims and your arguments kind of supported. Okay, here's another question. Let's see. I've seen some dissertations use first person or personal experience to leverage rationale for dissertations and practice. Would you recommend this or these types of personal disclosures? Mm, uh, good question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, sometimes it depends on what you're doing. Sometimes it depends on the school. Um, typically first person support not, not, it's not used a lot. Let me just put it that way. It's, it's not the norm. Um, now there, there can be times when it can be helpful. Sometimes things like personal communication, like, especially if you're doing, um, like a project study or some kind of applied study at, at a specific, like school, say, or a specific company. Um, and you're, you know, you have personal communication from, um, like your, you know, director or something, Sometimes that kind of personal communication can be used to support things. Um, as far as first person kind of personal experience, it, I'm going to say it, it depends. It depends on your study. It depends on um, your school. And it would depend on your chair. I would ask your chair if you have uh, questions about that. I mean, now there are some, there are types of studies that are auto by, you know, kind of auto ethnography you know and that would definitely be a first person thing but that's a very specific type of study um but i would say for typical studies um usually the first person experience uh, material is not part of it 
But again, like I said, with the caveat that it can be, it depends on what you're doing. <clears throat> I know that's a little <laughs> kind of hedgy, but um, that's the best answer I have for you. Um, so yeah, it depends on what you're doing, depends on um, your direction, your study, what kind of study you're doing. Um, there are some where that would work. Um, <clears throat> and even if you are doing a more traditional type of study without the first person, um, the personal angle, um, even if you come to a topic from personal experience, like you're a nurse and you see things firsthand, you know, all the time and you see problems, um, if you're not doing that type of study that allows that, it's okay to come to a topic that way, um, but you would still need to find some support for it, if that makes sense. Because sometimes if you're not doing a type of study that, that allows that kind of first person experience, the first thing your professor is going to say, well, who cares? I mean, you you experienced that, but that, that doesn't mean that it's, you know, other people are. So um, if you're doing a more traditional study and you're coming at it from a personal angle, it's always best to try to find some support for that. But that, that, that's a great question. So there, there are, I'm going to say, usually no, but there are some cases where, yes, that could, that could work. Okay, anything else? Well, great, excellent questions. I wanna appreciate, um, let's say thank you all for coming and um, thank you for your time. And um, we offer other webinars on other topics. Um, so be sure to check out our website and see what we're offering and what, what else might work for you. All right, thank you everybody. Have a great day.